Amanda Jones, welcome to Unbroken. I'm so happy to be here. So <laughs> exciting. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Me too. It's been ages since we've had a conversation, so I'm really looking forward to it as well. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got involved in this kind of work, that kind of thing. Right. Well, um, I would say about eight years ago, I, well, my, my back background, I was a professional dancer for 25 years. And then through that time developed various eating disorders and depression. And I had to retire because of those uh, struggles. And I came across Amy Johnson and Michael Neal, and that kind of catapulted me into um, the understanding of the three principles and blew my world upside down. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I really... Had, I had been a kind of a spiritual seeker from very, very, very young. I mean, just kind of like having this sense that something's off here. Like people around me, adults around me are telling me how the world is and how, how I am. And it just felt off, like something, <laughs> something's not right here. And so I was very, as a child, very um, kind of suspicious about how does anybody know what's going on here and come to find out nobody does. And that's the freedom, right? <laughs> right. That's the, that's the, really the, 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 the piece that passes understanding is that, is that nobody knows what's going on. And um, even more than that, I, I really, it, things started to sh change, change in a big way for me when I woke up to thought. So just like a, a fish waking up to water that I had no idea, of course I didn't until I did, that everything is thought, all of it is thought, all of it is thought in, in a way that is um, nebulous and pliable and changing and fluid and seamless, that there's nothing to pin down and hold and grasp. And I think for me, the, the trying to pin down and grasp and hold my identity in one place for long enough to feel okay, the failure of doing that, of being able to do that, got so painful that when I started to learn about this and learn about thought and, um, you know, the, the deeper experience of us, I, I really, I really came to see that, that nothing is as I think it is, uh, that my failure to pin down an identity or a, a feeling or a self was a success. Mm. This whole time I was succeeding at doing what is impossible and unnecessary and was just like the, the pain that it caused was showing me this is not supposed to, <laughs> you're not, <laughs> this doesn't, this isn't it. Right. But I, I, of course, the mind conditioned mind interpreted that failure as well. Let me just try again. Let me just find the right thing, the right diet, the right book, the right um, way of thinking. And then I'll, I'll succeed. But it was all on a false premise. And the false premise was that any ideas about myself, the world are completely made up, mostly inherited, unquestioned. And um, really, uh, really just, it was just huge for me. And so to kind of go forward in time, I started, uh, I just really woke up and continued to do so. And then I started coaching myself. I went through some training and I now... Um, a colleague with Amy in her little school of big change. And I have my own clients and I wrote a book and I have a podcast and <laughs> things just 
things just unfold in, in ways that I had no idea about. And think, you know, it's, it's really beautiful to come to see that, uh, everything we think is wrong with ourselves that we can't seem to change is what's perfect. Mm. The, again, the inability to succeed at changing something that is not how you think it is, that does not actually really exist in that way is a success. Mm-hmm. So I'll pause there and see if what you, <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> yeah. What I'm curious about is you talked about it being a painful time trying to find an identity. Mm-hmm. So w- can you say a bit more about that? Like, were you looking for the bumpers on the side and t- to try to sort of stay in your lane or what did that look like? Yes. Yeah, so, well, first of all, as a child, uh, we are, we are given an identity. Oh, she's like that. Oh, she's always like that. Or he's like that, you know? And so that kind of starts to build this build, fill in the, these empty, beautiful emptiness, this beautiful emptiness that we really are at core with ideas. And then as that self idea develops, it takes these little pieces and learns what is safe, what is okay, what is not okay, what is acceptable to feel, what this means, what that feeling means. Um, And so it's like a a, a holographic um, kaleidoscope that kind of melds into this sense of me and feels solid, feels real, and feels worthy of being relevant, protecting, defending trying to make better because you're not you're never all all the way there (laughs) there's always a (laughs) little bit more you could do better right (laughs) yeah so yeah so the bumper thing was came as the unquestioned amount of ideas that were building upon each other started to become kind of invisible so it would be like um i need to look a certain way weigh a certain way feel a certain way or else i uh everything would come crashing down. Mm. And the, you know, the irony is you, that's what you want. (laughs) We, we've got to have it all come crashing down because it's not solid in the first place. It, It was just invisible and all of the signs and information was there through all the suffering and the pain and the, you know, just, um, suffering that, believing in an imaginary character engenders. Oh, I love that phrase, an imaginary character. That's so great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. The um just like everything is thought, so is the self. Because mm. if thought is written in disappearing ink, so are you. There's a lot of times during the day that you, the the self isn't even there. And then it comes back online and says, oh, I was distracted. (laughs) Oh, I was in the zone. No, you weren't. You weren't there. (laughs) So it's really fun to start to poke holes in the narrative that keeps trying to rebuild the sandcastle of the dream character. And Mm -hmm. that's natural. There's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. But to live in that sandcastle as if the tide isn't coming in, as it does, is to suffer a lot. And, and, and really to allow the, the, the tide to come in and wash it all away and then watch the phenomenon of it being rebuilt and then wash away and rebuilt and wash away. It's a very beautiful experience that kind of loosens the grip that the mind has on its most prized possession, which is its story about me. Mm. And did you find it scary at the beginning to, uh, to lean into that, the, the washing away and the rebuilding? I don't think I understood that that's what was happening. Mm. So the, the scariness was kind of more in the realm of um, grieving an identity that I um, tried so hard to create and make whole and solid. 
Um, but that was very temporary. So I, I wouldn't say it was scary for me. I know I know some of my clients, it's it's very scary, but that's such a temporary place. It's like the 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 unweaving at the beginning kind of feels very unstable and very kind of uh, what's going on here. And there's there's searching for handholds and purchase, and that's fine. But we come to, to see that those handholds are falling with us. That they were never giving us what we needed, but they're fine. They're they're there, like mm -hmm. a handhold in terms of um, something that's helpful, like a book or uh, exploration into this whole thing. Um, and so that it makes it really, it makes the fear really come back into perspective when you understand that there's not you can't lose anything you never had. Mm. Right. Yeah. And we, I, I'm hearkening back to a feeling at the beginning of my exploration of this understanding, which was, yeah, that feeling of sand slipping through my fingers. And I guess I realized that eventually I just got used to that, you know, yes. and that your tide metaphor is so great because it does build back up again. We, of course, mm -hmm. we always have thoughts about ourselves mm -hmm. and then, yeah. And then they, sometimes they break down and wash away and then, yeah. 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 Fascinating. Wow. That's it's really It's fun great. to, to be the perspective of the ocean rather than the sandcastle. <laughs> yes. Um, because, <laughs> because I would, I would say that is kind of a little bit more accurate. I mean, it's a metaphor, so we can't really push it too far, but um, to, to, I had for years, built a sandcastle and kept adding on a little bit more packed in sand, a little bit more higher turret, some flags over here. Like it's an <laughs> unending urban development project <laughs> right? only to be washed away and you have to start over again. And it's that kind of tension between the washing away and the building that releases when we see the whole phenomenon. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's so well said. Thank you. Yeah. And I like, yeah, it's, it's, it's at some point we do realize we're the ocean, not the sand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you today was what you think gets in between us and our healthy relationship with food, if anything, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think the number one thing is a misunderstanding about feelings mm. um the way i see it is that um well chris nybauer who wrote no self no problem shared that we were feeling being 600 million years before conscious thought mm. so we we are feeling organisms and when the brain evolved suddenly conceptual thought came in and said, okay, I've, I, I'm here. I've got a hold on things. What's this feeling? And it starts to add meaning and judgment and characteristics onto what was already naturally flowing through for 600 million years. So in that way, we have been conditioned to um, relegate certain feelings to being unacceptable, scary. Some of them need help. Uh, some of them are completely fine. And it, I think it's that little confusion that brings us looking for relief in terms of, in, in, in the form of anything, food, anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's that it's, it's, it's conceptual thought that has adopted the role of manager over feelings yeah does that make sense that's yeah <laughs> yeah no I totally I can I understand that and agree and yeah it's so easy for our big problem-solving brains to get in there and want to as you say be the manager you know mm -hmm. sort everything out um put it into categories rather than just letting it be what it is. Yes. Yes. And it's weird because the, the, the thinking mind is a beautiful 
machine of logic and reason. But when it comes to the realm of the imaginary, meaning who I think I am and who the world is and what I, you know, my worthiness, my love of all of that, that whole imaginary realm, reason and logic have no place. And, and that's confusing for the conceptual mind. And so, you know, confusion is also taken to be something unbearable to feel. Mm -hmm. And so, well, I'm just going to um, not feel this because I, I have been taught and my mind is telling me that there's danger here. And that's, I mean, it's a perfect, the, the food stuff is a, is a symptom of forgetting, misunderstanding, being confused and taking that seriously. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Assigning it a lot of meaning and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas confusion can become a curious traveling partner. Mm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I love that. I mean, it really, <laughs> Yeah. It's yeah. Just, no, it's so true. I don't know yeah. what's happening here and that's okay. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Because if I know what's happening, then I know what should be happening and it's not this. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's where we, that's where we get a little bit lost. I, the mind gets a little bit lost because this, this um, desperation to know um, what can't be known is is you know kind of running the show in terms of what i believe is right and wrong for me and the world my body whatever um and it's it's interesting because trying to figure out reality the very the reality in that way is is defined by the inability to to know what it is to figure it out so <laughs> you like the, the 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 walls we're trying to break through are being built by our attempt to break through them right it's 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 all a fantastically brilliant i don't know what <laughs> uh, magic show yes yeah <laughs> right yeah yeah exactly Oh, I love that. Yeah. It's such a paradox, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And someone I was speaking to recently, and I, unfortunately, I can't remember who it was said that when we get into that feeling of paradox of where our circuits feel like they're frying and we can't quite get it, that's a really great place to yeah. be. You're yes. closer to the truth in that yes. feeling. Yeah. I call <laughs> it getting your eggs scrambled. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like you we we kind of come into this conversation in hopes of getting popped out of our orbit for mm. long enough to be completely confused enough that the mind regroups itself in a more expansive and curious landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so great so if people are listening right now going i have no idea what she's talking about good <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> yeah i was just gonna say when your clients get confused you must get excited oh i do i love yeah. it <laughs> i love it and you know it's so beautiful to watch those knots untie mm. that that we the mind has believed are necessary for our existence and to mm -hmm. be alive um and it's just, it's really beautiful to watch that release happen. Um, that is our birthright. I mean, we're designed to wake up just like we wake up from a nighttime dream. We're designed during the day to wake up from the daytime dream. It's all the same dream, but the, the degree of perspective is, is a little bit different, and, but we're designed to wake up. Everybody I know, even if they won't admit it, knows there's something wonky going on here. Like, you you can't tell me, anybody you ask, anybody can tell you a story of, yeah, when I was little, I kind of uh, 
you know, would, would think about weird things and, you know, daydream and kind of wonder. And that's, that kind of gets conditioned out of a lot of us, but it never goes anywhere. I mean, we are the wonder. There's this beautiful quote that says, um, many sit and wonder, few sit in wonder. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that's so true. I love that. Lovely. So um, if you're, one of the things I wanted to ask you is if you're working with someone who's struggling to change an eating habit or some disordered eating, um, it's kind of a difficult question, but where do you begin with them? Mm. Generally, I, I want to see what what reality looks like to them what mm. what are they what do, who do they think they are and what the world is mm. like wh what are the premises that are being lived from that we can start to kind of question and start to rattle apart mm -hmm. um because i i don't see any other way like starting with from the food thing is um doesn't doesn't work i mean if that was the, was the key, then there wouldn't be 5 million gazillion books about diets and food. <laughs> There'd mm -hmm. be one. <laughs> You're right. So, yeah. So it's really about going into starting to allow people to wake up to what this self-identity is, what it's made of, what it isn't. Um, because really it's the self-identity that dictates what's believed about the body. So as that loosens up, that kind of grip on the identity and who I think I am loosens up the beliefs also fall away about the body and what's good and bad right and wrong and all of that stuff mm -hmm. yeah yeah so true and um is there something specific that you can point to that you see your clients struggling with uh around eating like is there a commonality yeah. Yes, that I would say um, the overload of information and rules and what other people have shared gets to be very kind of obscuring in in the face of simplicity. Mm. So I wrote about this in that in in my book. When we're young, we look to our parents and caregivers to sh to show us how to be. How do you cross the street and not get hit by a car? Um, <laughs> but and that is that is a learning for the whole system. The whole system is always learning. But with this again, with this who I am, self identity, the self, the self idea, to to look outside quote unquote is a, a disaster so so i would say it's the overload of information and in, regarding food and diet and bodies the overload of information that has been um, absorbed can really make this much more complicated than it is like rules even science even um you know nutrition science they all have their utility all of these things have their utility but the um they don't address the underlying beliefs the underlying illusions um that are happening so i think that would be the first thing that would come to mind that I hear a lot, um, rules and regulations. And then, you know, those are woven into my, the identity's own rules and regulations. And mm. it's all just, yeah. 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 And I know for me, it was scary to, I had gotten in, into the habit of uh, absorbing so much information about how to eat and what to eat and when to eat it. And just, I just kept searching for that kind of structure and it was yeah. so absurd because it never worked. And yet yeah. I would keep going back to mm -hmm. that place and thinking, well, either I'm the problem. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I just can't figure this out 
it didn't actually ever occur to me that the system was broken, you know, <laughs> yes. uh, the, yeah, the diet system that, yes. that, that information was only adding to the problem. Right. Again, yeah. you were successful that whole time in, in your failure. Right. Right. Make that yes. happen. <laughs> I mean, yes. it's yeah. true. Um, how to eat, when to eat, what to eat. Um, is really absurd in the light of our, in the light of realizing that the conceptual mind is an amalgam of, of learned ideas and concepts. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> the, you, the, the conceptual mind isn't beating your heart. It's not uh, reviving your cells. It, it has nothing to do with that yet. It, yet it is the thing that is kind of um, front and center on, you know, on center stage, but backstage, there's a whole unknown wonderland that, that is working with no problem. Yeah. And so I really advocate for curiosity and tuning into whatever is being felt right now in real time, you get information and it's simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just recalling the confusion again, that that caused me because mm -hmm. our culture is just not set up that way. But, no. Yeah. It's especially because one of the things that the self identity can do is uh, tell you to look, uh, point you to look everywhere else, but at it. Mm. So that failed must be my problem. I'll try again. Something's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I'm broken. Yeah. Uh, and so what we want to do is really turn the turn the spotlight on that self identity. What is it? Mm -hmm. Bring it in close. What is it? What is it? What is it created from? What is it? You know, feel like? Is it really there? Can you find it? Uh, all of those inquiries really help everything to come back into kind of a a more aligned experience that that calms everything down you know it i don't like i don't like this phrase but it brings the power back to something that's not in the realm of imagination gone off the rails mm -hmm. yeah yeah i love that and has your you well, sh let me back up and just say in your book uncovery you talk about your personal journey and your uh times of disordered eating mm -hmm. and then since then um do you find that your relationship with food has changed you know even since you started to see what was really going on oh absolutely mm. absolutely um it's really interesting because the the relationship with food has has kind of uh, it's kind of receding on the on the horizon there is no more relationship with food mm. i would say mm. there's a body walking towards the fridge there's a body eating there's thoughts about food there's you know but it's very there's there there isn't a, a captain at, at the helm barking orders at the ocean anymore <laughs> right <laughs> So I wouldn't even say there's a relationship with food. I know what you mean, but mm -hmm. it's very much a, a distant horizon thing. It's more kind of dreamlike, mm -hmm. as I recall what it used to feel like. Mm -hmm. Right. And I love that you said earlier uh, that the suffering that we experience is pointing toward the different kind of existence or relationship that we can have. Mm -hmm. um, it's pointing toward the fact that we don't understand something that's really going on. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a big, big flag saying, stop. There's hallucination happening, <laughs> complete hallucination. Um, you're, there's nothing happening, but that mm -hmm. there's no failure. There's no success. There's no backtracking. There's no progress. There's just a hallucination right now. And suffering is the only way the system has to wake itself up. Right. It's not going to be able to do that with 
um, any other kind of feeling I don't see. Um, no, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 We've been listening to our minds for so long and that's, that's not the place to go to for the messages. So yeah, yeah the, the suffering is the thing that wakes the us up. Feeling. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so intelligent, mm -hmm. but it's been interpreted backwards. Yes. And that yeah. takes a while, maybe or not, to kind of reorganize and reorient. Um, mm. And then, and then once that is helped along a little bit through the conversations like these, mm -hmm. then uh, it, uh, people just come back alive to where they've <laughs> never left, <laughs> except yes. in thought. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. And so that actually really connects well to, I had a question about the wisdom of our bodies and, mm -hmm. and how that connects to eating. I'd love for you to say anything more you can think of, of about that wisdom, because that's a place that I fall asleep to and then wake up mm -hmm. to again quite mm -hmm. often. So the way I see it is that we don't fall asleep we're not the ones falling asleep and waking up. Mm -hmm. That's thought identified. So I'll just say that first. Sure. <laughs> Secondly, um, I I I I no longer see wisdom. Uh, I no longer see see that the body um, has wisdom. I don't think wisdom is. Uh, possessed okay. by a body okay i think it is it is the a mystery about the source of it and then the manifestation of it and then the outcome of it um so so saying that i think that's why we sometimes feel that i i i forgot and then i wake up to it if we think that it's coming from a source then that sets up this stage where I could forget and then remember mm. the source. So the wisdom of the body and, and in, at the same time, yes, there does seem to be something beyond conceptual ideas that's going on. And if we can call that wisdom, um, but it's not ours. There's nobody that uh, that that holds it and obtains it and possesses it. I don't see that anymore, at mm. all. Mm. Um, because the one who would have wisdom, I have seen to not be what I thought it was. Mm. So, what do you think wisdom is? It's a concept. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a word. It's a yeah. concept. Um, it's a, you know, we live in a worded world. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a consensus overlay of words and descriptions and concepts that are mistaken to be reality, actual reflections of something actual. And it's not the case. I have seen that's not the case. This is my experience. So the wis words like wisdom and awareness and consciousness are beautiful um, source, uh, beautiful benchmark kind of symbols for something we have no idea what it is. Right. We have no, nobody does, no idea. Yeah. <laughs> and again, then, you know, once we kind of lean into that and really see how that is the case for us, then we can come back to the concepts and use them playfully mm. use them for the, their utility mm -hmm. being able to have a conversation for example mm -hmm. um, I don't know what wisdom is beyond the fact that it's a word and a concept mm -hmm. gotcha there's that great <laughs> quote um the finger that points at the moon is not the moon right yes. so that that's kind of what we're alluding to you're alluding to here mm -hmm. and yeah. 
to push that further, the moon and the finger are the same thought construct. There's, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> yeah. That, that the, the moon is, is an illusory aspect of the finger. They are inseparable. There's no moon without the finger in that metaphor, right? Mm. There's no finger without the moon. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little way of saying, um, I really encourage people to kind of explore this idea that there's something hidden from you. There's something out there that you just have to discover or uncover, or um, there's a puzzle piece that's out there for you that's missing. And I'm going to point you to it. And that, you know, keeps us focused away from the magic right here. The the wonder of being able to even point to a moon. Hmm. That there is nothing wrong with you. There is nothing you lack. There is nothing you need. And yet we can have this experience of lack and want and need and fulfillment and let it wash away with the tide that comes in next. Right. Having that, the experience of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Very cool. So we've, we just, as we're starting to wrap up here, I wanted to mention a couple of things. One was your book, which we've talked about. It's called Uncovery and tell us a little bit about that and where people can find it. It is on Amazon worldwide. And I wrote it in 2017 and it goes a lot into three principles. Um, so if people are curious about that, it just tells my story and then it goes into um, my journey. Not my, it's not very personal at all. It's really just kind of laid laid out in a way that helps one to wake up out of the dream of thought or wake up into the dream of thought to see what it really is and how it how it's really everything how it's really the the missing puzzle piece that you didn't even know was missing <laughs> contrary <laughs> to what i just said <laughs> right. right it's all a paradox yeah um yeah so that uh it it's due for a updated edition but 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 i have i've i have found that it's really it's really been helpful for people just really starting to kind of get interested in this conversation Mm -hmm, definitely. It was, yeah, one of the first books that I read and I found mm -hmm. it incredibly helpful. And mm -hmm. isn't it funny how those of us who have written about this stuff, as we evolve, there's, there does feel like this impulse to go back and revise yeah. what we've written before. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And I, and I know that that's just a function of, um, this, this idea that, that, there's a right way that will stay the right way. Mm. And there is it. Whatever came through in that book is just as right and wrong now as it will be in 50 years. Yes. And it's it, you know, the it's for the reader to wake up to what they hear. And uh it's got nothing to do with me. Or if I, you know, if I need to change anything. Yeah. Yeah. And we can, I always remind myself too, we can never know what's going, how things are going to land with people. And I just always remember, I have a friend who recorded a podcast actually with someone and thought it was terrible. Like she just didn't think that she articulated herself well, and she was really concerned about it. She almost asked the host not to release it. And it, it's the most popular podcast episode that she's ever recorded. <laughs> people are constantly going to her and saying, I love, I got so much out of that. Yep. I've listened to it four times. So yeah, yeah we just never know. <laughs> that's exactly it. And that's illustrating what I said before is nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Literally nobody knows. And and to pretend to know what's going on is painful. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like what I the podcast that I have with my colleague is we have, we, we do episodes and then we're like, I have no idea what I just said, no idea if it's good or bad. And let's just find out. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that I have found is the seriousness mm. 
of whatever this is has really faded away and um it can be it can be conjured up when appropriate i suppose but it's <laughs> no longer uh a driving force towards from uh, you know behind behavior or action or you know anything like that yeah so your podcast is the wonderland the wonderland three words the wonderland yes. yeah <laughs> and it's with my my colleague uh, Alex Linares, and it's a dramatic, magical, fun exploration. Cool, and <laughs> yeah. people can find that wherever they get podcasts. That's right, wherever yes. they get podcasts. Yeah, cool. Okay, and is there anything you'd like to share before we wrap up that we haven't touched on yet today? Oh boy. Um, I would just love people, if one thing they want to take away from co this conversation is to maybe see how it's true rather than how it isn't true, that there's nothing wrong with you. And there never has been. Great. I love that. Thank you. So where can we find out more about you and your work? My website is uncoveryspace.com. And all my words are on there. All the words of what, <laughs> all the things are there. Yeah. <laughs> you can contact me through that. Yes. Great. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And I will put links to the podcast and to your website in the show notes at unbrokenpodcast.com. Thank you, darling. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Lovely to connect with you again. Take care. Yay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>